I started dating Willow out of a sense of obligation to repay her kindness. I pursued her for three whole years before this Yandera finally accepted me. At 20, we got our marriage certificate, and then she unexpectedly became pregnant and gave birth to David. But until David was seven, our marriage was nothing more than a hidden one. I never even gave her a proper wedding. She was always anxious, constantly testing my limits, repeatedly questioning whether I truly loved her. If things didn't go her way, she would lash out at me with vicious words. And my son, following her example, never learned to respect me. Then one day, my mother passed away. I handled the cremation alone and returned home, utterly exhausted, only to find that my son had intentionally locked me out of the house. Chapter 1 Outside, it was pouring rain. I took off my coat and covered the urn with it, pressing the doorbell repeatedly. It was only evening, but the sky was already dark. Heavy clouds loomed overhead, with occasional flashes of lightning and thunder, and a fierce wind howled through the streets, as if signaling the end of the world. Just like my state of mind, my sobs were drowned out by the torrential rain, and the sky seemed to weep along with me, as tears soaked me to the bone. As I kept pressing the doorbell, I eventually began to pound on the door with clenched fists. Inside the small villa, the lights on the first floor were all on, and I could vaguely see the large TV in the living room playing a cheerful and funny cartoon. Willow was out of town on a business trip, but my biological son David was inside the warm house. He heard me. He did it on purpose. This prank of changing the house's door code after I left happened from time to time. It seemed my persistent doorbell ringing had finally annoyed him. David pressed the intercom, speaking irritably. Why didn't you bring the spare key when you went out? So stupid. Figure it out yourself. His still childish voice came through the machine, distorted and unfamiliar in the chaotic environment. I leaned against the corner, wiping the rain and tears from my face to clear my blurred vision, trying to shield the urn in my arms with my body. I didn't want my mother to get wet. I couldn't take care of her while she was alive. And now that she's gone, this is the only thing I can do for her. I fought to suppress the choking in my throat and coldly said to David, I'll say this one last time. David, open the door for me. The light on the intercom flickered a few times and I could hear a bit of the TV sound inside. Then David said nothing. The small patch of light before me suddenly went out. In the silent world, I bent over and leaned against the wall, my eyes slightly red, my body stiff, standing as silent as a statue in the storm. Perhaps a long time passed, or maybe just a moment. I calmly accepted the reality that I had lost my son. Then I smiled, blinked, and softly said to my mother, It's okay, mom, let's go, I'll take you home. With that, I turned away walking resolutely through the rain. From this day on, I lost my mother, and David lost his father. Chapter 2 I took a taxi back to the southern part of the city. Far from the Lu family's neighborhood, this area had few grand high-rise buildings. Instead, it was filled with old and aging apartment complexes. Yet, I felt an unprecedented sense of relief and peace here. As I stepped into the narrow, dimly lit stairwell, the warm yellow voice-activated lights flickered on with each step I took up the stairs. It felt as though they were saying to me, it's been a while, welcome home. But when I reached the fifth floor and stood in front of the familiar door to my home, I realized with frustration that my pockets were empty. Raindrops dripped from my pant legs, quickly forming a small puddle at my feet, and the cool breeze in the hallway instantly sent chills up my arms. Without hesitating too long, I turned and knocked on the neighbor's door. The door soon opened, revealing a man with disheveled hair, wearing a tank top and shorts, a cigarette but dangling from his mouth. He looked at me, and I looked at him. Both of us momentarily stunned. I had expected Uncle Han to answer the door, but instead, I slowly nodded, letting the raindrops from my hair fall, and gave him a polite smile that was hard to fault. Sorry to bother you, but I remember my mom left a spare key to our house with you. Could you please get it for me? My former best friend, Makoto, took the apple out of his mouth, his gaze lingering on my disheveled appearance for a moment, filled with a mix of emotions. Then he said coldly and distantly, Wait a moment. He went back inside, found the key and handed it to me, I took it, murmuring a small thank you, nothing more was said between us, right now, I didn't have the energy to deal with the shattered relationship between us, I forced a smile at him, then took the key, opened my door, and stepped into my home, I turned on the light, and the sudden brightness stung my tired eyes, causing tears to involuntarily slip down my cheeks, the inside of the house was clean and tidy, spotless, with everything arranged just the way I remembered. It felt as if my mother had just stepped out to buy groceries and would be back soon. I carefully placed my mother's urn on the table. My fingers accidentally brushed against a thin layer of dust on the surface, and I froze for a moment, as the tears began to flow uncontrollably. I had helped her escape a failed marriage, taking her away from the cheating, abusive scumbag. I had promised to buy her a big house, to ensure she would live a good life, but she always refused. She said she was already living well, 
that after I married a rich family's daughter, the disparity between our family's wealth was too great. If I bought her a big house, people would gossip, saying I must have taken a lot of money from my wife and that I was a phoenix man. The money I gave her over the years, she had almost entirely saved up. It had become a small passbook, along with her ashes, one of the few belongings she left for me. After her divorce, my mother's favorite thing to do was to flip through the photo album of me and David. Her rough hands left one mark of longing after another on the pages, but whenever I brought her to stay at our home for a few days so she could see her grandson more, she would often leave in a hurry after just one meal, because Willow didn't like having her mother-in-law in the house, treating her with politeness but coldness, and David, no matter how much I scolded him, always wore his disdain and annoyance towards his grandmother on his face. I thought I still had time to change all of this, but who would have known that my mother had cancer, and she kept it from me, refusing to tell me. By the time I found out and took her to the hospital for treatment, it was already too late. I sat in the chair, silently weeping, consumed by guilt and remorse. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. I thought it might be David, bringing the driver with him to come find me, and my brows furrowed as I opened the door, full of anger. But outside the door stood Makoto, holding a bowl of ginger soup, with a chubby little boy around four or five years old. Seeing me frozen in place, Makoto sighed. He took the little boy by the hand, walked into my house without hesitation, and said, you're soaked to the bone and not going to take a shower and change, you want to catch a cold. Chapter 3 There were still many of my old clothes left at home, all of them washed, dried, and neatly stored in the closet by my mother. After taking a shower, my eyes red from crying. I stepped out of the bathroom and found myself at a loss for what to do next. The TV was on, with a little boy sitting quietly on the sofa watching it, while Makoto, with practiced ease, had picked up a wrench and was fixing the old, worn-out pipes. As soon as the boy saw me come out, he sweetly called out, Hello, Godfather. I paused, towel in hand. Looking at Makoto in confusion, he casually handed me a bowl of freshly made porridge and, with a slight nod of his chin, gestured for me to eat. Then, in a calm tone, he introduced, This is my son, Kenta. He's five years old. I almost choked on the porridge, my eyes widening as I blurted out, You got married? It wasn't that I was overreacting, but since our school days, Makoto had been a staunch advocate of not getting married. He often joked that when he had enough money, he would just lie back and enjoy life, and when he'd had his fill, he wouldn't burden anyone. If he had some spare cash, he'd open a retirement home to cater specifically to people like him. But Makoto simply raised an eyebrow and replied, Who says you have to get married to have a child? George, do you have any idea how many people consider me their unforgettable first love? He explained to me that this was a child left to him by his ex-girlfriend after she cheated on him. She had failed in her attempt to win him back and, in her despair, wanted to reconcile with him, but he refused and cut off all contact. After all, a woman who could abandon her own child didn't deserve to be a mother. He had once thought he'd live out his life alone, but now he found that spending every day raising a child, eating, drinking, and enjoying life wasn't such a bad experience after all. I glanced at Kenta with some concern, and he, Years of brotherhood had kept our bond strong. Makoto understood what I meant without me needing to finish my sentence. He waved his hand dismissively, and Kenta immediately hopped off the sofa, running over with little huffs and puffs, looking up at his dad with bright eyes that resembled a puppy's. Makoto smiled and pinched his chubby cheeks, saying, he's carefree, he doesn't care who his mother is. I even suspect he'd call anyone who gives him tasty treats and fun toys, dad. Makoto gave him a light tap on the back of the head, and Kenta instantly turned to me. Wrapping his small arms around mine, he said, enunciating each word clearly, Godfather, can I play with your phone? If I call you dad from now on, would that be okay? Hearing him call me dad left me momentarily dazed. For years, David had been growing more and more unruly at home. He was always disrespectful, treating everyone around him with the purest form of malice a child could muster. And when he saw me get angry, it only made him more gleeful. All of this started because, one day, he didn't like the food and poured the leftovers over the nanny to show his dissatisfaction. In a fit of rage, I gave him a smack on the bottom. That was the first and last time I ever laid a hand on him, because when Willow found out, she immediately called the police, sending me to the station for a lesson, and even threatened to have me detained if I ever touched our child again. After that, he started calling me by my full name. It had been so long since he last called me dad. I swallowed the bitterness in my throat, feeling a swirl of complex emotions at Kenta's innocent dad. I patted his head suddenly remembering a call Makoto once made to me, and I smiled, saying, that's right, I'm your other dad in this world, Kenta cheered, his chubby arms wrapping around my neck as he happily wiggled around, like a fluffy golden retriever puppy, Makoto's sarcastic tone came from above, 
I thought someone had completely forgotten their promise to me. I vaguely remembered that in the early hours of one morning, half awake, I received a frantic call from Makoto. When I heard his panicked voice on the other end of the line, I knew something was terribly wrong. Sure enough, he was out of breath as he said. George, I've done what you asked, but something unexpected happened. I bought a train ticket for 3 a.m. and I'm leaving right away. But, I cut him off before he could finish. Makoto, remember this, you will always be my brother. From now on, your family is my family. Your parents are my parents. If you have siblings, they're my siblings. And if you have children, they're my children. You don't need to worry. So how could I possibly forget? He's been my best brother for life. But as soon as I said those words, he immediately hung up. And we lost contact after that. It wasn't until a year later that we found out it was a false alarm. And he no longer needed to drift around without a home. But after he came back, the Lu family gave him a hush money and demanded he never show up in front of the Lu family again. Willow even forbade him from having any contact with me or the Lu family would find a way to put him in jail. Thinking about it, I let out a long sigh. So many years had passed, yet it felt like only an instant. Just then, my phone suddenly rang, and the caller was Willow. Chapter 4, Where Did You Go? As soon as I answered, that familiar yet cold and distant voice came through. Makoto signaled Kenta to lower the TV volume, then crossed his arms and glared at me from the side. Kenta glanced at his dad and then mimicked him, crossing his own little arms and blinking up at me with wide eyes. Seeing the two of them, so alike as if they were cut from the same mold, I couldn't help but chuckle. When I didn't respond, Willow was silent for a moment. Then her tone softened, with a hint of pleading. David can't sleep. He wants to hear a bedtime story from his daddy. George, please come back. Okay, he's just a child. Don't hold it against him. It was always like this. Every time David misbehaved, she would only coax him and indulge him. Even if he committed the gravest of mistakes. She wouldn't let me lay a finger on him and would even go so far as to lash out at me. With a mother who always had his back, it was no wonder David didn't respect me as his father. She loved to play the role of the doting mother while forbidding me from being the strict father. She thought it didn't matter, that he was just a mischievous child who would outgrow it in time. I let out a slow breath, feeling weary. I really didn't want to argue anymore. So, I calmly asked her, when are you coming back? On the other end of the line, Willow let out a light laugh, as if she had expected me to ask this. Just before Willow left on her business trip, a rich kid from her social circle had sent me a photo. In the photo, a drunken Willow, her cheeks flushed red, leaned against his arm, with her hand seemingly tugging at his tie, while the young man smirked smugly. Although there was nothing overtly explicit in the image, the suggestive posture and atmosphere were clear to anyone with eyes. At the time, I was already in a bad mood due to my mother's worsening illness. Seeing that photo, I couldn't hold back my anger and had a huge fight with Willow, but she seemed to relish it. Smiling in satisfaction as she watched me seethe with jealousy over her being with another man. This wasn't the first time she'd done something like this, but it had gotten progressively worse, to the point of absurdity. Willow was very good at being manipulative. She loved to test my feelings for her, trying to fill that insatiable need for security. Every time, after I lost my temper, she would act hurt and tearful, claiming she didn't want to behave this way but was just afraid of losing me. This time, her excuse was that she was simply trying to help the man with his tie and accidentally fell into his arms. Furious, I demanded to know why she was even touching another man's tie. As a married woman, didn't she have any sense of boundaries? She shed a few tears, but I refused to relent, insisting that she give me an answer. So, she instantly grew cold, told me to calm down, and left me to return to work, leaving for her trip the very next day. And so, we began a cold war. In the past, it never lasted more than three days before I would be the one to make peace. This time, Willow was still waiting for me to make the first move. But seven or eight days passed, and Willow never received a call from me. When David complained to her, she took the opportunity to call me, giving me a way to smooth things over. After her soft laugh, she asked, Do you realize your mistake? Do you know what you did wrong? She was waiting for me to apologize, to admit my fault, and to sweet talk her. Only when she was thoroughly appeased would she forgive me, and as a reward, she would tell me she'd be coming home the next day. It had been ten years, and she never tired of this routine, but now. I was tired of it. I was silent for so long that Willow began to sense something was off and tentatively called out. Honey. I mimicked her soft laugh, my tone as casual as if I were commenting on the weather. Willow, come home soon. Let's get a divorce. Chapter 5. After dinner, Makoto and I ordered some drinks. Kenta came over, curious to try some, but Makoto quickly scooped him up and put him back in the bedroom. Though he initially flailed his little arms and legs in protest, within a minute, he was sound asleep, snoring softly like a little piglet. Ah, the quality of a child's sleep is truly something else. The two of us hadn't had a night like this in a long time. Drinking and reminiscing, 
Our conversation flowing from the funny moments of our youth to the grand ambitions we had in high school. Most of it was playful banter, with the occasional hint of nostalgia. Looking back on those times when most of our experiences could now be laughed off. But the more we drank, the more chaotic my thoughts became. It was as if, in an instant, perhaps triggered by a single word, my mind was flooded with past and present troubles, all swirling together in a tangle I couldn't unravel. One moment I was talking about how awful the food was at the school cafeteria, and the next, my thoughts drifted to the last time I was home. When my mother made a huge meal for me, she proudly said, maybe the food I make isn't as good as the Lu family's private chefs, but these are all your favorite dishes from when you were little. As long as I can still cook, I want to make them for you. Once I'm gone, you won't have them anymore. At the time, I just scolded her for saying such ominous things. But now, as I recalled it, guilt overwhelmed me like a tidal wave. That day at the dinner table, she kept watching me, barely touching her own food. I can't remember the exact look in her eyes. Only that when Willow urged me to leave, my mother hurriedly got up and went to the kitchen to bring out seven or eight jars of pickled garlic that she'd made. My childhood favorite. She carefully packed them into a bag, reminding me as she did so. You have a bad habit of saving the best things for last, never wanting to use them. But when things spoil, it's a waste. What's the point of regretting it then? She handed me the bag, smiling as she looked at me. She said, you should eat when it's time to eat. Do what you need to do, and let go of what needs to be let go. Some things, once they're gone, are gone. Don't hold on to memories and dwell in the past. You're my only son. Your happiness is more important than anything else. All right, go on now. Don't keep your wife waiting. Take these with you and let your wife and son try them too, I left in a hurry, giving my mother nothing but the sight of my back as I walked away, but because I came home late, Willow threw a huge tantrum, and those jars were all dumped into the trash that very night, thinking about it now, I suddenly found myself at a loss for words, drinking one glass of alcohol after another, the bitterness spread through my mouth, and I couldn't tell whether it was the memories or the alcohol that was more bitter, I took a breath and couldn't help but cough deeply, staring at the glass in my hand, I gave a silent, bitter smile. Makoto interrupted my thoughts, refilling my glass. He said, stop thinking about it. Just eat, drink, and let it all go. Get drunk, sleep it off, and let the past stay in the past. Tomorrow is a new day. My tears welled up, and I looked at him, choking on my words. My mother, she, Makoto had seen the urn. He knew everything. After a moment of silence, he gently patted my shoulder, offering no other words of comfort. Only a single sentence that had carried us through twenty years of friendship. Brother. I'm here. That night, Makoto and I drank until we were both drunk, like we were back in our school days, sleeping in the same room. But this time, he slept on the floor instead of the top bunk. I felt like a piece of driftwood lost at sea, having left the safe harbor of my mother. But now finding a moment of respite on the ship of friendship, there was no love anymore, nor did I need it. With Makoto and Kenta by my side, I slowly pulled myself together and began preparing for my mother's funeral. But a day later, Willow showed up at my doorstep with David. She looked as elegant as ever, wearing a meticulously tailored light blue dress, made of expensive, delicate fabric. She had her hair styled, the smooth strands falling over her shoulders, enhancing her already beautiful features. She held a box of homemade chocolate truffles in her hands, softening her otherwise cold aura. It was as if nothing had happened. Her lips curved into a faint smile as she said, Honey, let's go home. Okay. She knew that I had been attracted to her beauty from the very beginning, and she often used it to her advantage acting coquettish, seeing that face, any anger I felt would usually dissipate by at least half, but this time, I remained unmoved, I calmly told her, I've drafted the divorce papers, they're in our bedroom drawer, if there are no issues, let's find a time to finalize it, the smile vanished from Willow's lips, her gaze darkened as she stared at me, when she found no trace of humor in my expression, she paused, then, she avoided the topic, pushing the well-dressed little boy at her feet forward, her voice cold as she said, David, Apologize to your father, David, dressed in a brand name tracksuit, had his hands in his pockets, scowling with disdain, hearing Willow's words, he refused to look at me, staring instead at the stairs, muttering a half-hearted sorry with evident annoyance, Willow smiled and looked up, saying, honey, is that enough? All I felt was a pounding headache, did they really think I was that easy to placate? This mother and son duo clearly took me for a fool, my response was to shut the door in their faces with a heavy thud. Chapter 6 it seemed like Willow didn't quite grasp what had just happened. It was a while before my phone suddenly started ringing. When I answered, Willow's angry voice came through. She was struggling to keep her temper in check as she asked, George, do you really have to be this childish? Why are you being so petty with a child? Childish. Then what would you call all those melodramatic performances Willow put on for me before? Was she just being shameless? 
I sneered back at her. You don't have to come looking for me, Willow. Just seeing the two of you makes me sick to my stomach. Willow's breath hitched abruptly. I had never spoken to her like this before. Even when I was utterly exhausted by her willful behavior, I never showed her this level of disgust and weariness. In her eyes, I was supposed to be the person who loved her the most in this world, who cared for her the most. How could I possibly say something like this to her? Willow's breathing betrayed her growing panic, as if she was afraid of hearing anything more hurtful from me. She quickly hung up the phone. I held the phone in my hand, leaning back into the sofa, and exhaled deeply. The truth is, Willow and I came from two entirely different worlds. We never should have crossed paths. Willow came from an illustrious family. Her parents were titans in the business world, and she had been raised in luxury, a stunning beauty, cherished by everyone around her. The only regret was that her parents were too busy, so she was raised by her grandmother. Her grandmother was elderly and doted on her excessively. When she couldn't control Willow, she indulged her temper, turning the young Willow into a spoiled and willful child. Then, one day, young Willow was kidnapped. The kidnappers were vicious, not only demanding a huge ransom but also harboring some sickening desires. Although Willow was eventually rescued unharmed, the ordeal left her mentally shattered, and her personality changed dramatically. No one knew what she had gone through during that harrowing time. Afterward, her parents remained busy, and only her guilt-ridden grandmother stayed by her side. Year after year, later, I was in a car accident, and my family couldn't afford the treatment. The person who hit me was even poorer than my family. I was on the verge of dying in my hospital bed when Willow's grandmother stepped in to save me. By then, she was very old, sitting in a wheelchair, leaning on a cane, her face weary, but her eyes still sharp. She investigated my family background and spent a few days getting to know me. Then she asked me if I would be willing to make a deal with her. She said she had saved my life and hoped that I would, in turn, save her granddaughter. Her granddaughter, Willow, was still very young, beautiful, and intelligent, but she was as cold as ice, cutting herself off from the world. She didn't want to watch Willow live a lonely life or allow her to spiral into self-destruction, but she didn't have much time left. I didn't know how to repay such a life-saving debt and it felt like I had no choice in the matter. I could only agree. That day was just three days before I was supposed to start at the prestigious university I had worked so hard to get into. I had already planned that I would work part-time during university, graduate, find a good job, and then help my mother divorce that scumbag. I wanted to give her a good life. My future was bright and within reach, but reality turned out differently. My mother successfully divorced, but I never went to university. I was sent to the Lou family by Willow's grandmother where I devoted myself entirely to getting close to Willow, warming her, healing her, letting her step on my bones as she climbed out of her abyss. When she finally dared to leave her comfort zone and step into the sunlight, my fate had already become inextricably tied to hers. Willow's grandmother passed away peacefully, without any regrets, but she never told me how long I would have to repay this life-saving debt and all the other help I had received over the years before it would be considered repaid. Chapter 7 Willow was unaware of all this. She had become completely dependent on me. Even though I had been by her side for three years, she still feared that I would suddenly disappear and leave her. So, she wanted to keep me with her forever. As soon as she reached the right age, she hastily arranged for us to get our marriage certificate. But even with that certificate, she still felt uneasy. Every day, she would come up with new ways to ask me, Do you love me? I tirelessly responded, Yes, I love you, I love you. After all, I had been by Willow's side since I was 17 and had never been in a relationship before. Besides, Willow was very beautiful. Sometimes, when she lowered her long lashes and stared at me without blinking, my heart would truly race. Her condition improved significantly after she became pregnant with David. It was around that time that Willow, who had always thought she was an only child, unexpectedly discovered that her parents had secretly had a son, and he was already nearly 10 years old. Feeling helpless and wronged, she turned to me for help, with my support. She began to fight for power in the company. I enticed and Makoto pressured, and with Willow being naturally intelligent, she quickly gained the shareholders' support. After she successfully seized power, she no longer feared the outside world, but she gradually began to neglect me. Yet, she still held onto her old habits with me, relishing in seeing my emotions swing wildly because of her, enjoying the sight of me getting angry on her behalf. From these intense emotions, she would contentedly draw the love she needed. It's been ten years, four ten years. I've been her husband who wasn't fit to be seen. In her social circles, I was kept in the shadows, and in her company, I was like a ghost, invisible and irrelevant. The reflection in the mirror showed a man with hollow, tired eyes, as if all vitality had been drained from him. Meanwhile, Willow had transformed like a phoenix rising from the ashes, becoming more mature and elegant, her aura even more dignified and refined. 
Time seemed to have barely left a trace on her exquisite face, but I could hardly remember. What was 17-year-old Willow like when George first met her? What was 20-year-old Willow like? The one who was so full of love for George, who dreamed of marrying him, who needed to cling to him every night to fall asleep. I couldn't remember, but I did remember that we still hadn't had our wedding. I once said I would use the money I had saved over the years to give her a grand wedding. She hesitated, saying it might be better not to. Seeing my confusion, she tried to explain. I want a wedding with just the two of us. You've done so much for me. So on our wedding day, I want to be the one to confess to you, and I'll ask you over and over again if you love me. You only need to answer. I love you. No one else needs to witness it. I'll remember that moment forever, knowing that you will always love me. How could I not understand the hidden meaning behind her words? Ten years have passed, and those painful yet happy youthful days are gone. My mother's death was a wake-up call, finally pulling me out of the foggy dream I had been living in. I realized that what needed to be done had to be done, and the past had to be left in the past. I couldn't hold on to it any longer. Since David didn't need me as his father, I would leave him with the Lou family. In a way, this could be seen as a life for a life. The debt of gratitude should have been repaid long ago. From now on, I will no longer be Willow's husband. Nor will I be David's father. I will just be myself. I will be George. The George who picks up the university acceptance letter he missed at 17. Ready to set off on a new journey. Chapter 8. My mother's funeral was a modest affair. After all, she had been married for many years. Dedicating herself entirely to the family. Relatives had become distant. And friends had lost touch. So there were hardly any people who would have come to her funeral. So, I saved the money and chose a burial plot for her with a beautiful view. At first, I bought one plot. But later. I bought two more, because Makoto insisted on copying the tradition from the outlaws of Mount Liang. He said that if George were to be buried here in the future, he planned to be buried here too, brothers in life, brothers on the road to the afterlife, and companions in the next life as well. Kenta, fully agreeing, raised his little hand and said he wanted a plot too. Makoto flicked his forehead, telling him that he could choose one when he grew up. You're too young now. If you don't like it after we buy it, you'll make a fuss. What had originally been a heavy matter was made so light and lively by them that the sorrow weighing on my heart was considerably lifted. Kenta, feeling a bit disappointed about not having his own burial plot, held my hand on the way back and said, Dad, then buy me an ice cream. That'll make me feel better. Makoto scolded him. What are you sad about? You already had a cone this morning, and now you want another. Are you planning to lose all your teeth? Kenta, a master at looking pitiful, gave me a pleading look. I was speechless and just as I was considering whether to buy him one or not, a sharp shout suddenly rang out from behind. He's my dad. You can't call him that. David appeared out of nowhere and pushed Kenta hard, knocking him to the ground. Kenta caught himself with his hands, but the tender skin on his palms immediately got scraped and started bleeding. He bit his lip, and tears welled up in his eyes as he cried out, Dad. Anger surged within me as I helped him up, glaring coldly at David, who stood there with clenched fists and red eyes, glaring back at me. David flinched under the intensity of my gaze, his pupils contracting slightly, his expression was stubborn, his tone accusatory, as he reminded me, word by word, I'm your son, I immediately frowned and said to him, I don't have a son as despicable as you, David froze on the spot, when he finally snapped out of it, tears streamed down his face in large drops, but he still stubbornly tried to hold back his sobs, wiping his tears away with his sleeve, he looked up at me, eyes full of defiance, and shouted, if you don't go back, Mom's going to leave with another man, I knew that. Lately, I had been receiving a lot of taunting texts and photos of Willow being intimate with different young men. Blocking and deleting them didn't help, so I ended up getting a new phone number. Willow hadn't learned a thing. She still believed this tactic would always work on me, but I didn't care about her anymore. So why would I care about what she did with anyone else? My expression remained calm as I gently patted Kenta's back, soothing him, but when it came to David, I was utterly indifferent, saying, that's perfect you can just get a new dad. David looked at me in disbelief, as if he was only now realizing that my attitude toward him had completely changed, and that, maybe, I really didn't want him anymore. David, still a child, couldn't hold back his sobs any longer and began to cry loudly. He clung to my leg, sitting on the ground and refusing to let go, crying so hard he started to hiccup. You, you have to come back with me. You can't be someone else's dad. Kenta had already stopped crying. He looked down at David who was crying and throwing a tantrum on the ground, with wide eyes. Then he frowned and said to me disdainfully, Dad, I don't want this brother. He cries so ugly. David heard this and his crying stopped for a moment. I took the opportunity to pull my leg free, then coldly glanced at the bodyguards watching from the side of the road. I said, don't worry, he's not your brother. You don't need to care about him. The bodyguards hesitated before stepping forward to help their young master up, 
David, his eyes glazed over, looked up at me, as if my words had truly hurt him, but I simply took Kenta's hand and turned to leave, I didn't spare David another glance. Chapter 9 Getting the divorce certificate from Willow wasn't easy, especially when she finally realized and learned about my mother's passing. The incessant stream of taunting texts and flirtatious photos with various socialites suddenly vanished, leaving me in peace. When Willow showed up at my door again, she wasn't wearing a designer dress, nor had she done her hair. Her hair hung loose, her face pale and drawn, looking rather pitiful. It was clear she wasn't in a good state. It seemed she had finally realized that when I said I wanted a divorce, I meant it. Some things needed to be discussed, so I let both of them in. David was unusually quiet this time. He stood beside Willow, clutching her skirt, but his eyes were fixed on me, filled with cautious longing, but no matter how he looked at me, I didn't return his gaze. I acted as if he didn't exist. Willow sat across from me, her expression showing guilt as she softly said, I'm sorry, George, I didn't know your mother's illness was so serious. Why didn't you tell me earlier? If I had known, I could have hired the top medical team in the country to treat her, no matter the cost. I would have made sure she got better. I felt calm as I told her. She was in the late stages of cancer. It was untreatable. Telling you wouldn't have changed anything. And besides, she was my mother, not yours. You never even called her mom. So why suddenly care now? It's only natural you didn't pay attention. On the day she passed, I was with her the whole time. She had no regrets. She was at peace. Willow's pupils trembled, and her face turned even paler. She forced a dry smile, weakly saying, we're married, so she was my mother too, her words were laughable, as if she had shown her any respect or care while she was alive, I couldn't help but sneer out loud, Willow closed her eyes in embarrassment, after a moment, she changed the subject, saying, I'll have the Lu family take care of the funeral, no need, I couldn't stand her pretense any longer, so I cut her off, I took out a document I had prepared earlier from under the table and pushed it toward her, before I could say anything, Willow suddenly stood up, her voice breaking. George, don't do this. Her eyes were red, and she was trembling uncontrollably. She suddenly grabbed my hand and fell to her knees in front of me. Her voice was almost pleading as she said, you can't, I won't agree. Honey, I'll never agree to a divorce. I slowly pulled my hand out of her grasp. Before she could completely lose control, I pointed to the document on the table and said, read it first. Willow hesitated for a moment, then picked up the document. Seeing that it wasn't a divorce agreement, she let out a sigh of relief. But as she continued reading, her brows furrowed deeper and deeper. Her hands began to clench around the pages, her breathing growing more rapid, as she flipped through it with increasing urgency. When she reached the last page and saw my signature, written with a shaky hand from years ago, Willow's eyes were red with anger as she spat out, a transaction. All those years you spent with me, loving me, was it all just to repay a debt to grandma, a transaction? The document in her hands was the contract I had signed with Willow's grandmother all those years ago. It clearly stated that everything I had done for Willow over the years was not out of love, but rather as a fulfillment of a contract, a series of demands laid out in black and white. Willow stared blankly at the printed words for a long time, and at that moment, I delivered the final blow with a smile. Willow, why don't you ask me again, if I love you? Chapter 10 Willow stormed out, leaving behind a quietly sobbing David, clutching his clothes and refusing to leave. He didn't fully understand the argument between his parents. The contract or the transaction, but he understood one thing, dad was going to divorce mom and leave them, he slowly walked over to me, his tear-streaked face finally showing none of the defiance or arrogance it once did, his eyes filled with fear and uncertainty as he hesitantly took hold of my hand, choking out, dad, I'm sorry, it had been a long time since I'd heard him call me dad, but now, looking at David and hearing him call me that, all I could think of was that rainy evening when he locked me and my mother outside, I couldn't bring myself to feel any sympathy for him anymore, in fact, as I looked at him, all I felt was a burning anger deep within me, we were father and son, bound by blood, yet he had only ever cared about his bond with his mother, as for me, his father, born into poverty, he couldn't even be bothered to glance my way, he had no respect for my mother, and he looked down on my background, to him, only his mother was worth caring about, yet, because Willow disliked the school environment, I was the one who attended every parent-teacher meeting and event, and on the rare occasion that Willow attended, he would be overjoyed proudly introducing his beautiful mother to all his classmates. I shook his hand off and sneered at him, saying, What dad? I'm just your caretaker, aren't I? Just a caretaker you can't get rid of. One who disciplines you, which is why you hate me and have done everything you can to drive me away, right? Well, David, you've finally gotten your wish. David shook his head desperately, pretending to be ignorant as he tried to hug me. No, you're my dad. I pushed him away, gripping his shoulders to make him stand up straight, and said, 
David, you're not a little kid anymore. If you can't respect my authority, then I won't treat you like a child. You're a man now. So you need to bear the consequences of your actions. I called the bodyguard who had been looking after David and told him to take him out of the house. As I was closing the door, I remembered what David had said to me through the intercom that rainy day when I was soaked to the skin. I smiled slightly and softly said to him, Your dad doesn't want you anymore, David. The door slammed shut. David threw himself against it, banging and crying, his wails echoing through the hallway. But no one came to comfort him. A few days later, Willow asked to meet with me. She agreed to the divorce. I stared at the text message for a long time, then prepared some things and went to the meeting on time. Willow was wearing a tailored black dress, her expression cold and distant, once again exuding that untouchable elegance. On the table lay the divorce agreement I had drafted earlier. I was asking for 50 million in cash. I didn't want the car the house, or the child. Given the work I had done for the company over the years, this amount was more than enough. And for Willow, it should have been within an acceptable range. Additionally, I planned to keep the shares Willow had given me during our relationship. Willow quietly watched as I signed my name on the paper. When I pushed the agreement toward her, she didn't make any move to take it. Instead, Willow curled her lips into a bitter smile, staring at me as she almost spat out her words through gritted teeth, you deceived me, and you think you can just walk away and leave me behind. I looked at her for a moment, then calmly asked, Do you want to take revenge on me? Willow let out a scornful laugh, leaning forward as she replied in a cold, contemptuous tone, Do you think you're worth it? Her gaze swept over my face inch by inch as she bitterly said, You want to leave, to abandon me, but I won't let you have your way. I'll make sure you stay by my side forever. You won't be able to go anywhere. We stared at each other in silence, locked in a tense standoff. After a long time, I sighed. Reaching into my bag and pulling out a stack of medical reports. I'm seriously ill. Willow. Willow froze. The icy mask on her face slipping away completely. Chapter 11. Willow snatched the medical reports from me. Her slender fingers trembled as they brushed over the dark mass on the ultrasound image. How strange. She always seemed to remember to look back only when she was on the verge of losing something. But when everything was fine, she never seemed to care. When I was sick, she never said a warm word to me. But when she was ill. If I failed to take care of her in any way, she would accuse me of being uncaring and insensitive. Then she'd throw a fit, blaming me for not pampering her even when I was unwell, and for making her angry. Are all women like this? It doesn't matter anymore. I said calmly, sign the papers. Willow, I'll only agree to treatment after we're divorced. Willow looked up at me, frowning and slightly parting her lips as if to say something. I stared into her eyes and added, my health isn't good. If the treatment fails, I don't have more than a few months left. Don't make me die with regrets. Okay. Willow fell silent. After a long pause, she finally picked up the pen and signed the divorce agreement. I had everything prepared, and while she was still processing it, I pushed her to finalize the divorce at the registry that very afternoon. With the divorce certificate in hand, I breathed a sigh of relief. I was finally free. As we left the Civil Affairs Bureau, Willow suggested that I return to the Lou family home, but I refused. She frowned and said, In your condition, how can you manage on your own, at home? Mrs. John can take care of you, and besides, I raised the divorce certificate and waved it in front of her. Willow glanced at my pale, frail face and fell silent, but she couldn't help asking, when will you come back? I could guess what she was thinking at that moment, since I wouldn't live long without treatment. She believed she had to comply with my demands for now. Once I recovered and everything was back to normal, she thought she would have plenty of opportunities to reconcile with me. She never truly believed that we would be apart for good, but that's okay. I'll give her time to come to terms with reality. My cab arrived at the curb. I got into the car, watching Willow hesitate as if she wanted to stop me but was unsure. It was almost amusing. It seemed she only wanted to hold on when something was slipping away and only wanted to cherish it when it was already lost. As if her sincerity always came with conditions attached. For the sake of my peace in the days ahead, I warned her. Keep an eye on David. Don't let him show up in front of me again. And that goes for you too. With that, I told the driver to go leaving Willow standing there with a grim expression. Makoto and I had once promised each other a spontaneous trip together in our youth, but for a while, we doubted we would ever get the chance, but now, we had all the time in the world. When I got back and told him the good news about my divorce, he immediately opened a bottle of his father's 20-year-old vintage wine to celebrate with me. The next day, we began our journey, traveling all over the country. We took Kenta with us, visiting the vast herds of cattle and sheep on the Hilumber grasslands, the sun-kissed peaks of Tibet the first snowfall at the Forbidden City, and the misty rainy season in the south. We had the time of our lives. Kenta was full of energy, not only keeping up with the pace but also being the best cheerleader, the perfect little companion. In the freedom of the open air, I felt like I had come alive again. 
With my best friend from the past and his child, I traveled to every place that had once been a dream of our youth. It was as if the soul that had been trapped in that hospital bed at 17 had finally awakened 10 years later. Of course, the journey wasn't entirely smooth. My phone was nearly flooded with calls from Willow. I didn't have a terminal illness. That was just a lie to get her to sign the papers. Chapter 12 When Willow first found out about the truth, she was absolutely furious. She nearly flew to Li Jiang to confront me. But I just said, we're already divorced. Can't you let go of me, Willow? That shut her up. Because if she couldn't let go and kept chasing after me, it would make her look like a lovesick fool, which would be a disgrace to the Lu family's eldest daughter. So, Willow stopped contacting me, just like during the countless cold wars we had in the past. Only this time, I wouldn't be the one to call her and beg for reconciliation. This time, I was relieved. These trivial, meaningless matters would no longer disturb my peace of mind. I opened my arms and embraced this new world that belonged to me. A year later, when Kenta was ready to start school, we ended our joyful travels. However, the day we returned home, I saw that familiar figure again. Willow was standing downstairs, staring up at my window. She looked as graceful and elegant as ever, standing out from the surroundings, drawing the attention and whispers of the neighborhood. I went about my day, eating, showering, changing clothes, until night fell and I was ready to sleep. She was still there, like a statue waiting for her husband's return, sighing. I went downstairs to see her. When Willow saw me, her face lit up with joy. She smiled and said, George, I knew you couldn't stay away from me. Come home with me. This past year, David has been crying and misbehaving, even neglecting his studies, all because he wants to see his dad. Seeing that I remained unmoved, Willow's voice trailed off. The evening breeze rustled the leaves, and the old streetlight cast a faint glow beside her. Finally, she dropped the pretense of using the child as an excuse and quietly said, I've missed you. I'm sorry. I suddenly laughed and asked her, exactly what are you sorry for? Willow's eyes brightened instantly. She stepped closer, speaking quickly, I never cheated on you, not physically or emotionally. You know me, I just wanted to see if you still cared about me. I'm sorry about your mom, and I'm sorry for hurting you with my selfishness. She went on and on, saying that she hadn't stopped thinking about me for a single day this past year. She said she had seriously reflected on everything, but none of that mattered to me anymore. I told her, look. You've managed just fine without me this past year. Willow, it's not that you can't live without me. You're just used to having me around, and you don't want to let go. Willow's eyes reddened suddenly, and she shook her head, insisting that wasn't true. But I asked her, why don't you ask me that question anymore? Chapter 13 Willow's lips trembled, and her expression showed fear. She pressed her lips together, refusing to speak. So, I sighed and answered for her, yes, I did love you. What do you think kept me by your side for so long? If it was just to repay a debt, I could have left as soon as I helped you take over the company. Willow forced a smile that was more heartbreaking than tears, and she reached out to hug me, but I held up my hand to stop her and took a step back, calmly, I said, but that's all in the past. Willow, I've completely let go of you, and you should move on too. Willow couldn't let go. When she couldn't get closer, she clung to my arm, tears streaming down her face as she repeatedly muttered her refusal. She couldn't accept the reality that I no longer loved her. She started begging desperately digging through her memories for the good times we had shared, but I resolutely pulled her hands away, pushed her back, and turned to go upstairs. That night, Willow cried so loudly outside that the entire neighborhood couldn't sleep. Eventually, someone called the police for disturbing the peace, and the officers took her away. The next day, Willow returned to the neighborhood, her eyes swollen, and fell asleep in her car. On the third day, I passed an online interview with a big company. I quickly packed my bags and left while Willow wasn't paying attention. Later, Willow showed up at my new job a few times, but I either avoided her or spoke harshly to her. After being together for so many years, she knew how to hurt me, and I knew what words would truly cut her deep. Gradually, she stopped coming. Then I got a call from Makoto. He told me, with exasperation, that Willow, or sometimes David, would show up at my old house to stay. In my rush to get divorced, I had forgotten to change the locks. I was silent for a long time. Finally, I said, it's fine, let it be, when they're ready to move on, they'll stop going there, until they leave my house, I won't go back, my life has restarted, this time, I'll move forward without looking back, 